Bill's Mafia. On tonight's Air Raid Hour, Dave and I will be sharing dueling Buffalo Bills seven round mock drafts with a twist. No mm. simulators were used in the creation of these mock drafts tonight. Instead, we relied solely on Dane Brugler's of the athletic draft grades. But before we get into our dueling mocks, this little bit of intro music, because that was an awkward segue. One Network Podcast. Here are your hosts, Judge Mathis and Tilt Money. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to the Air Raid Hour. Dave, tonight we will be doing dueling mock drafts using Dean Brugler of the Athletics Draft Grades. He just came out with his The Beast Draft Guide. If you are not a member of the athletic. I honestly just suggest signing up for one month. Maybe you'll even get a little free trial. Download that draft guide because it is worth it. Best out there. Dane Brugler. Yeah, it's, it's the best out there. I love the draft Twitter community, but if we're talking mainstream draft analysts, Mel Kuyper will is, and always will be my boy because that's just a nostalgia pick in terms of, of those mainstream draft guys. I think Jordan Reed is on the come up. I think Jordan Gre- Jordan Reed of ESPN, formerly of the Draft Network, I hope he's the one who takes the mantle from Mel Kuyper because I think he's probably, in my opinion, the best in the game right now. And then there's Dan- Daniel Jeremiah and Dane Brugler, a ton of great content creators in this draft community, and we're going to be using Dane Brugler's The Beast tonight to create our mock drafts. Yeah, so the way this is going to work is when we pick where there's going to be no trades, we're each picking with the bills, what the bills have slotted right now in the pick that we get to. So Dane Brugler does have a top 100 as well. The bills pick, you cannot pick anyone that's ranked higher than the slot that the bills are picking. So pick 28, you cannot pick anyone ranked on Dane's list from one through 27, 60. Obviously you can't pick anyone below 60 and so on through to the hundred. Once you get to third and fourth, fifth and beyond, you have to use Dane Brugler's draft round projection to guide you as to whether or Mm -hmm. not you can take a guy. So if you're in the sixth round and you like Javon Bullard, but Dane Brugler has him as a second rounder, you cannot, you cannot take Javon Bullard in Mm -hmm. the sixth round. So those are the rules. And that's what we tried to stick to tonight for these mocks. All right, so let's get into it. With the 28th overall pick, I select Adnay Mitchell, wide receiver, out of the University of Texas, and you take Johnny Newton, Mm three-tech IDL, out of the University of Illinois. I'll let you lead off. Sell your pick. Why did you take Jerzon Johnny Newton out of the University of Illinois? Well, just so for full disclosure, Johnny Newton was Dane Brugler's 28th ranked prospect. So I just Just made it. it. (laughs) I just made it. And it made sense. Look, Johnny Newton's been gaining a ton of steam. Obviously, um, you know, coming back, doing all the workouts. There was the question about like what he was going to do. Obviously didn't, uh, you know, didn't have the testing numbers to fill out the RAS, but he is just an absolute disruptor on the interior. I fully believe he's going to get picked before pick 28. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's a really a realistic shot. There's there. there's a lot of rumblings, man. I'll, I'll tell you what. I, I'm seeing, a, and again, mock drafts are mock drafts. I'm seeing mock drafts now with him in the second round. Well, if that's the case, then I I would be hard-pressed potentially to pass on yeah. him in at pick 28. Second most sacks of any interior mm-hmm. defensive lineman in college football in 2023. Uh, PFF's 12th overall graded interior defensive lineman yeah. fully in 2023. He's played over 40 games in his career, tons of experience, 27 and a half tackles for loss and 18 sacks in his career, 6'2", 280, perfect three tech archetype rotational player to have on that interior with Ed Oliver in 
that rotation that the Bills employ. And we need a guy that can bring some swagger along mm-hmm. with Ed Oliver to that interior of the defensive line as a disruptor, right? When you think about what Johnny Newton can do, he can disrupt games. He can be a game wrecker. He can pressure the pocket from up the middle. He can get penetration and be an, be a menace in the run game. Um, and to me, with how deep this wide receiver class is, and we'll see as my mock plays out, it was really hard for me to pass on Johnny Newton with pick 28. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I I was when I looked at his his big board and I saw all the names after 28. The decision that I ultimately went with was go get the highest ceiling X receiver on the board. And that's what I did with Adnay Mitchell, six foot two, 205 pounds. He's got 32 inch arms. So you have a lot of hope that he can use those arms to his advantage when he's, you know, covered in, in, in man to man situations. Transferred from Georgia, has played a number of games in the college football playoffs and has had big games in big moments in the college football playoffs in his career. He is just a guy. He is so fluid. He's a high IQ route runner. He is a good ball tracker. He gets open at all levels of the field. He can do the short stuff. He can do the intermediate stuff, and he can be a threat deep. He is a true prototypical X. So if you're the Buffalo Bills and you're comfortable with maybe some of the I don't even want to say character concerns, but like work ethic concern. Effort. Yeah. Concern, yeah. Right. If you are sold that this guy will get to the NFL and you're coaching and the professional behavior of the room around him will wake him up and bring the most out of him and make him the best version of himself. Adnay Mitchell could end up being one of the best wide receivers in this class, including the top three, because he's got mm. that ceiling. I think he's got a higher ceiling than Brian Thomas Jr., And that is why when I ultimately made my positional rankings, my official positional rankings, I put Adnay Mitchell because of the ceiling. I put him ahead of Brian Thomas Jr. I put him ahead of Xavier Leggett. So I'm pretty high on Adnay Mitchell. But again, it's the unknown. It's the thing that we don't know about. And the thing that we don't know about is the conversations he's having with NFL teams about some of those things that uh, have come up on his tape. So the, the combination of that, and maybe some physicality issues like getting getting hung up at the at the line of scrimmage getting pressed some of those things that he'll need to work on with NFL coaching but you you don't need to target this guy 15, you know 10 15 times a game his rookie year the buffalo bills under joe brady can spread the ball around by year 2 mm-hmm. by year 3 then i think adney mitchell can become a guy that you target 10 plus times a game so i went with the ceiling with my pick i went with adney mitchell I like the pick. Look, I mean, I, I am, there's a lot of people who are basically with the effort concerns, just like totally mm-hmm. discounting Adonai Mitchell and like either taking him off their boards or having him ranked super low, but the ceiling is undoubtedly there. I love this ball tracking in the games I watched. I know that that's been something that people have talked about, but like, mm-hmm. it seemed like he was just center fielding that thing, man, catching it, yeah, tracking it well. I, I I could be totally on board with that pick. All right. On to round two with the 60th overall pick in the NFL draft. I select Michael Hall Jr. Three tech defensive tackle out of Ohio State University. And you take Xavier Leggett, wide receiver out of South Carolina. Dave, tell the people why you chose Xavier Leggett to follow up Johnny Newton. And it's kind of interesting because we both went the same position groups, just in opposite order. You went D-tackle, then wide receiver. I went wide receiver and D-tackle. So talk to the people about your pick here, Xavier Leggett. Yeah, so look, um, there's a lot made about Xavier Leggett being sort of a one-year wonder. I, I... I really don't worry about that too much. Um, You're talking Mm -hmm. about a guy who had no one to take attention away from him on that South Carolina offense. You're talking about a guy who's 6'1", 212, ran a 4'3", 940, athletically just an absolute freak of nature, the 9.89 Raz, eighth most receiving yards in college football last year as pretty much the only guy on an island on that team, like I mentioned. Um, just outside the top 25 in yards per reception as well. 11th in yards per route run, which tells me that Mm -hmm. he's got a pretty diverse route tree and a deep route tree. 
when it matters for those with over 50 targets. Um, could he be the ceiling? Could he have the ceiling to be that number one X? Yes, he could. And I think for those reasons, when I think about Adonai Mitchell, I think about Xavier Leggett, I do think Adonai, Adonai Mitchell is probably a little bit smoother of a deep threat, I would say, than a Xavier Leggett could be. But I think Xavier Leggett physically can do everything that you need to for a true alpha X receiver. And for those reasons, and looking at Dane Brugler's rankings, that's why I paired Johnny Newton with Xavier Leggett with my first two picks, knowing that the Bills need that type of player in the building. Yeah, I mean, Xavier Leggett checks just so many boxes. I mean, down to the fact that he's got the frame to get after it in the run game and help in the run game. He can be used as a kick returner with these new kick returner rules. He can be the yards after catch guy that Joe Brady wants. He can be the take the top off the defense guy. He can be sort of a high point catcher that Josh Allen has really never had, if, unless you want to count Calvin Benjamin. I mean, just box after box after box after box. Xavier Leggett just checks those boxes. So huge fan of, of his game, huge fan of that pick. I think you crushed the first two. I think I crushed the first two as well because I'm I a big too. fan of Michael Hall Jr. We talked with John Helmkamp. He had a great senior bowl. It's the guy who comes from a prestige program, was a high recruit in Michael Hall Jr. He's got the athleticism to back it up. He got up to 290. That's the one issue with him, right, is the weight. He got up to 290 by the combine, six foot three, 290 pounds, 33-inch arms, 10-inch hands. This is a defensive tackle the Buffalo Bills are going to use behind Ed Oliver on uh, early downs to in, in the rotation and next to Ed Oliver on passing downs, and he's just going to be a disruptive vertical force he is just going to get vertical he's going to get towards the quarterback he's going to disrupt from the interior he's going to use his length to his advantage and that's going to i think help some of our edge rushers who are maybe more wrap-up sack kind of guys and aj epinesa mm -hmm. and gregor Rousseau. so michael hall jr i think is a huge asset and people can complain all they want about well he's not going to get this many snaps or that many snaps because we have a i don't care he is an interior disruptor you can never have too many interior disruptors Ed Oliver got hurt. And we lost to New England Patriots. Mm -hmm. Everyone remember that, right? We had come off a ton of other injuries as well, but it was, I think, Ed Oliver that broke the camel's back in that game. So you want to have a guy there behind Ed Oliver. If Ed Oliver gets dinged up, you want a guy who can replace Ed Oliver. I'm going with Michael Hall Jr. with this pick. Yeah, I do like that we, of the same mind in the sense that that mm -hmm. position, those positions seem to be top of mind for both of us. And, you know, we're, we're debating right now or not really even debating, but just talking about why we like whatever combination we had. But the facts remain, we both like defensive interior defensive line and wide receiver mm -hmm. with these first two picks. And I think those are two huge needs for the Buffalo bills going into this draft. And I think, you know, pick whatever guys you want, right? Whatever interior guy you want, whatever receiver you want in the first two rounds, I don't even care what order you pick them, but I, I can get on board with almost any mock draft or, or any draft I really see where you see that combination of positions getting picked in the first two picks. All right. On to the fourth round now. And with our first selection of the fourth round, this would be pick 128. I select Mason McCormick, interior offensive lineman out of South Dakota State. And you take Chavon Baker, wide receiver out of Central Florida. I know that people are pretty familiar with Javon Baker, but break down your selection of Javon Baker here. Wide receiver, double dip, back-to-back, -back, two boundary bodies. That's pretty exciting. Pretty exciting. Dane Brugler has Javon Baker as a fourth-round projection, so I could not pass off the opportunity to take Javon Baker with my first fourth-round pick in this mock draft and effectively take care of the double dip at wide receiver within my first three picks with Xavier Leggett being my last pick, Javon Baker being this pick, the average depth of target is there. The body control is there. You have now added to the room two guys that potentially could play X receiver for you on this offense. And in reality, now you can mix and match the guys on the boundary with Javon Baker, with, Xavier, with Xavier Leggett. And now you round out this, receiving room this offensive weaponry room with Khalil Shakir Dalton Kincaid Curtis Samuel with Xavier Leggett Javon Baker you still have Dawson Knox you still have James Cook that to me sounds really really exciting and obviously 
I've been a big fan of Javon Baker since really early on in the process. And I um, think the drops narratives overplayed mm-hmm. with that average depth of target. Obviously you've got that 21.9 yards per reception in 2023 can play inside and out 27% of his snaps snaps even came in the slot. So he can move around the field a little bit as well. That 17.1 average depth of target was the 12th, uh, 13th highest in college football for those with a minimum of 50 targets. So most receiving yards of anyone in the top 15 average depth of target. So a lot of things yeah. working in Javon Baker's favor. I couldn't pass him up. Yeah. I mean, if he's sitting there in the fourth round and the bills do pass him up, I, I will riot. Like if we take a receiver in the first two rounds, he's sitting there in the fourth round. I'll still want them to take him. <laughs> like that is how much I think everyone knows how much we at cover one here. Love us some Javon Baker. I decided to, to zag a little bit because I didn't want to, I would have, I would have taken Javon Baker if it was me, but I didn't want to take the same players as you did. Uh, So I wanted to switch things up a little bit. I went with Mason McCormick interior offensive lineman out of South Dakota state. This guy, he's built like Richie incognito and he Mm -hmm. plays like Richie incognito six foot four, 309 pounds, almost 34 inch arms, 10 inch hands. This dude, puts guys in the dirt and i know it is a smaller school south dakota state but just the mean streak that he plays with the way that he finishes the way that he pulls and gets out to the second level like he is he's got the goods now he does come from south dakota state so he's raw in a lot of areas and he might not be able to start right away but that's okay i don't think the bills need him to start right away but this is a guy who can Take the mantle from David Edwards at left guard in 2025. He could even move into center if you need him to move into center. He could probably play right guard if you need him to play right guard. Like by midseason, if someone gets hurt and you need him to play, you could probably put him out in the football field. Mason McCormick, to me, it just it's just another mean ass dude that Aaron Cromer can work with on the interior of that offensive line. Jim Nagy, who I have a number of conversations with this time of year. Every time I like I hype up a Shrine Bowl guy, he's always in my comments like, oh, there's the Senior Bowl guy that was better. And um, and he's right. Like NFL execs typically agree with Jim Nagy, right? There's a reason why certain guys were invited to the Senior Bowl and, and certain guys were left to the Shrine Bowl. Mason McCormick was a Shrine Bowl guy, but Jim Nagy literally came out and publicly said, I screwed up. This dude should have been here. Mm-hmm. The way he played at the Shrine Bowl, he should have been at the Senior Bowl. Like he should have been there. So Good on Jim I Nagy. Can- yeah, and so I consider Mason McCormick almost a senior bowl, senior bowl type dude, has that senior bowl type pedigree. To me, if he's sitting there in the fourth round, because he could easily go on day two, yep. Mason McCormick pulled the damn trigger because yep. left to right, eventually getting Deion Dawkins, Mason McCormick, Connor McGovern, Osiris Torrance, and Spencer Brown, those are some dogs. Like Those are absolute maulers. You won't be able to play too deep shell in the Buffalo Bills because they'll be running the ball down your throat. <sighs> would love a guy like that can you imagine like him mcgovern torrance in the middle of that offensive line Oof, that gets me excited and i mean like we said in the in our show sunday right like interior offensive line is a premium position at least being paid like one now in the nfl so we need to maybe react accordingly right and adjust our our you know our value proposition that we're giving Mm -hmm. to the interior offensive line All right, now on to our second selection in round four. This is five picks later, selection 133. I select Florida State cornerback Renardo Green, and you select Penn State offensive tackle Caden Wallace. Let's start with Caden Wallace. What sold you on the Penn State offensive alignment? Yeah, Caden Wallace for me has been gaining steam for the last couple weeks. And, you know, you'll see a lot of draft sites and simulators and such that probably have him below the fourth round. Dane Brugler has Caden Wallace solidly as a fourth round projection. So for me to uh to get him on board in this in this draft, I had to take him here with that second of the fourth round picks. And and I feel good about it, right? This is a guy who has played essentially exclusively at right tackle for three seasons at Penn State. Uh, came in and measured at the combine at just under 6'5", 315, 314. So archetype-wise, looks really solidly in the range mm-hmm. that a guy like Aaron Cromer would be looking for. He's 
It's got the huge hands, 10.75 inch hands, 34 inch arms, and that almost 83 inch wingspan, 8.19 Raz. This guy is tenacity. He looks for work. He's confident in himself. And I think he will perform well and has probably performed well in interviews. I mentioned on our Sunday show that teams like the 49ers are having Wallace in on top 30 visits. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is still obviously the opportunity that maybe he could slide inside as well at the next level. So I love a guy who has all that experience at right tackle gives you insurance for Spencer Brown beyond 2024 and pot potentially could slide in on the inside and just attitude wise motor tenacity effort just really checks a lot of boxes for me. So that's why I'm going Caden Wallace here with my last of the fourth round picks. Yeah, I, I took a little bit of a risk with mine, and I went Renardo Green out of Florida State. A little undersized, six foot 186, 31 inch arms, nine inch hands. And he comes from a defense at Florida State that's primarily man to man. So there's a lot of projecting going on here. But if you look at it, we have the the write up here from, from the draft network and looking over the various different scouting reports. Tell me if this doesn't sound like a player that fits the Buffalo Bills. Renato Green is an alignment versatile defensive back who makes impactful plays in pass coverage and the run game while also playing with a high level of intensity that affects the rest of the defense. This is a guy who started his career at Florida State as a safety. He can play nickel and he can play on the boundary. So he gives you and provides you that versatility. He is that ball of clay. Wherever the need develops, Renato Green can go and he can fill in that need. Maybe he can be a safety for you. Maybe he can be a nickel for you. Maybe he can be a boundary guy for you. So in that fourth round, you are taking a guy who is scheme versatile. He is just a hyper aggressive physical, despite his size tackler, a guy who's got good ball production, a guy who breaks up the ball, a guy who reads quarterbacks, right? Like another write up here that I saw of him in off coverage, Green shows to be a high instinct player who was able to understand route combinations to bait quarterbacks and make plays on the football. That's just that just to me screams Buffalo Bills defensive back. So again, mm. I know he is a Shrine Bowl guy. I know that, you know, he didn't get the he doesn't have the prototypical size. But to me, Renardo Green, it just fits the bill, fits the mold of what the Buffalo Bills are looking for in that secondary. He brings youth. He brings energy. He brings explosiveness. He brings versatility. Get Renardo Green into your organization and then figure out exactly what you want to do with him. I know that doesn't sound great on the surface, but to me, that's what you do with Renardo Green here and the back half of the fourth round. Well, and we've talked on the Sunday show about really the the future at cornerback in this on this roster is a bit murky, right? Rasul Douglas wasn't extended yet. Um, mm -hmm. you don't know what you're necessarily going to get out of Kair, Kair Elam continuing to go forward. Like could be a bit of a roller coaster there. And then you have Christian Benford who's, you know, he's there and he's solid and that's fine. But like th it's murky a bit beyond, you know, beyond some of these <laughs> beyond 2024, especially right. So like getting him in the room in 2024, mm -hmm. isn't necessarily a bad thing. So I don't mind it. All right, on to the fifth round now. The first of three selections in the fifth round. I have selected Anthony Gould, wide receiver, Oregon State, some redemption for Isaiah Hodgins. Hmm. And you have gone Mo Kamara, edge rusher, Colorado State. We've spoken at length about Mo Kamara in this pre-draft process and how much we love him. Our biggest issue being... Will Brandon Bean love those measurables? But talk about what sold you here on Mo Kamara with your first pick here in the fifth round. Yeah, and just for me personally, Mo Kamara is my 14th ranked edge, which does probably put him kind of in this fourth, fifth round range. Uh, Dane has him as a fifth, sixth round projection. Obviously, the production is incredible I, at the college level. Mountain West Defensive Player of the Year in 2023. Played in over 49 games, 33 starts in his career. Over 45 tackles for loss uh, in his career, 16 uh, and 17 in the last two years, respectively. Followed up eight and a half sacks in 2022 with 13 in 2023. The question is the size, but 
Uh, you read some of these scouting reports on Mo Kamara and you think about what kind of player could really use the guidance and the tutelage of a Von Miller. The Bills have their lengthy guys in Rousseau and Epinesa. I'd like a guy who has this much, much production and can get to the passer, even if it was at Colorado State, to come in and learn from Von Miller, right? These uh, strengths listed out by, by Lance Zerline of NFL.com uh, sets up inside rush move with hand upfield, violent hands, continuous assault on the pocket, plays with force and aggression, has the leverage and ba base strength. And he says he might drop some on draft day due to the measurables, but the kind of will to conquer he's shown typically translates in the NFL. Then you look at his weaknesses can become too reliant on power in his rush approach, inconsistent working back under. It's a lot of technique stuff, right? It's not necessarily things that you look at and you say he's limited physically. It's more mm -hmm. technical, uh, coachable type of things that I see from the scouting report of Mo Kamara. And I just cannot ignore that production. And I know that's, sometimes a, a fatal flaw, but this just seems like a guy who could come in and really learn from Von Miller from, on the technique side as Von Miller's at the twilight of his career. So got to get an edge somewhere. I went for it here, uh, passed on safety here and, and took the uber productive Mo Kamara. Yeah. I mean, I love Mo Kamara for all the reasons you mentioned by the time you get to the fifth round throw the measurables kind of maybe out the window. Go get yourself a guy who you think can be an impactful pass rusher, even if it's just in a situational role. Because any way you can affect or get to the quarterback, go out and get a guy who can who can do that. My pick is another guy who the measurables are not great, and that is Anthony Gould, the wide receiver out of Oregon State. Another yeah, Shrine Bowl, another Shrine Bowl guy. Five, <laughs> and when I say his size, he is small, five foot eight. 174 pounds, an arm length of less than 30 inches, 29, and a hand size of less than nine inches, eight and seven eighth. But if you look at this, I'm just going to read you Lance Zerline's overview of Anthony Gould, and it will, I think, sell you on him being the double dip receiver here to add name Mitchell. He gives you punt return flex. He mm -hmm. had two punt returns for touchdowns a couple of seasons ago in college. He was a Pac-12 special teams player of the year. He had a punt return for a touchdown in the Shrine Bowl. This guy mm -hmm. can come in from day one and be your punt returner. He can be your wide receiver five, six, and you can just put him on the field in these packages and you can utilize what I'm about to talk about here. And that is his speed. And he's more than just like a little gadgety guy. This is a legit wide receiver who just happens to be in a pint sized body. And this is Lance Zerline's overview of Anthony Gould. There will be a good deal of focus on his lack of size, but Gould's particular skill set should create discussions about how to make it work. He has electrifying long speed and spent a majority of his reps as an outside receiver working all three levels of the field. He has the shiftiness to uncover against tight man coverage from the slot, but can be utilized as a matchup problem deep against cornerbacks lacking speed. He can step in as a catch and run specialist with punt return talent, but has the capability to offer more in the future. The productive rookie season of Tank Dell in 2003 should have a positive influence on how teams view Gould's potential. This dude has electrifying sub 4 4 speed. This guy can separate underneath. Remember that big game Isaiah McKenzie had against the Patriots years and years and years ago that everyone thought, oh, he's the next coming because of that game? The guy like Anthony Gould is a guy you can pull out in games where guys like to play man coverage and his speed can be used as a weapon. And even when you're playing maybe zone teams or things like that, there's still a role for him as a guy you target a couple of times a game, as a guy who uses a punt returner. Get Anthony Gould on your football team. He, his electrifying speed is game-changing. And as we always talk about on this show, Dave, it's not just being fast. It's being fast and able to control your speed. And he plays with pace. Get Anthony Gould on your football team, Brandon B. Yeah, remember uh, the guy a couple years ago that everyone loved, Anthony Schwartz, except this guy can actually run routes. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it's like Anthony Schwartz speed, kind of body type, but can actually run routes yeah. underneath as well. So to me, a better looking prospect personally. All right. We are now on our second pick of round five, and this comes at 160 with the 160th pick. In the NFL 2024 NFL draft, I select Brennan Jackson, edge rusher out of Washington State University, and you select MJ Devonshire, 
cornerback mm. slash punt returner out of the University of Pittsburgh. So I think a lot of the reasons why I love Anthony Gould, that return flexibility, I think might be one of the reasons or the selling points for MJ Devonshire, who's been pretty connected to the Buffalo Bills in this pre-draft process. Dave, sell the people on MJ Devonshire here. Okay, so yeah, so pretty connected. And now look, I know there's some there's some issues, I will say, with Devonshire. He's going to be an older guy when he comes in. He's going to be 24, so we'll put that to the side for the moment. But a top 30 visit with the Buffalo Bills, so I can't ignore that. And we know the Bills love their pit DBs, Dane Jackson, DeMar Hamlin. They've been linked to A.J. Woods, obviously, who was another guy mm -hmm. I had considered in this mock. But MJ Devonshire, ton of games under his belt. Uh, the punt return ability that you just mentioned with Anthony Gould, he's got over 45 career punt returns in his career, only two kick returns. So he's really probably just going to be a punt returner. Some ball security issues there. I'm not going to discount that, but he did, mm -hmm. you know, he does have the experience there. Four interceptions uh, last year, led Pitt, and he led the ACC in pass breakups per game with 1.17 pass breakups per game. So a little bit of a tidbit there as far as his ability to get his hands on the football, leading the ACC in that category. Good ball skills, willing tackler. His measurables, you wonder, he's played essentially exclusively outside at the college level. You wonder if he has the ability to come in and play in the slot at the next level. But again, size, can play the outside, has the experience there. Maybe you can kind of bring him inside and out that'll be up to the coaching staff to figure that out but mm -hmm. a guy the bills are connected to get a young corner in the room that can maybe um offer you some punt return ability as well which is why i went with mj devonshire here i love that pick it trust me if i was doing mine from scratch and i didn't have yours to play off as well i probably would have fit mj devonshire in there i went brennan jackson and the reason why oh, i went brennan jackson and and i did no research on Brandon Jackson before the combine. He had a good combine. You mentioned him during our combine show. And the more I've been digging on Brandon Jackson, the more I fall in love with Brandon Jackson. We spoke about edge rushers on yesterday's show. We talked about in the later rounds, who, who are the guys who can play immediately? Brandon Jackson can play from day one in the national football league, six foot four, 264 pounds, 32 plus inch arms, this is probably the highest motor edge rusher in the class, yep. period. Yep. I'm not talking of all the late round, period. period. He might, he his motor right might run the hottest of any player. This guy just plays with more effort than you will see from a lot of players. And he comes, I think, day one, packaged and ready to be a physical presence in the run game. I think he's a high IQ player in the run game so he can give you early down snaps and he can save some guys for later downs to maybe be the pass rusher and brennan jackson's a guy who over time maybe he can develop a pass rush skill set it's kind of nice to be in a defensive line room with a guy like von miller who hosts clinics on these types of things now i think the one big knock on brennan jackson is the lack of the pass rush plan that he has which i think he can be worked on and he can play right away because of his run defense and setting the edge. And I think number two is an NFL.com. Um, when they asked, they asked a scout, like the sources tell us, and an AFC national scout told Lance Zierline, I think coaches will like him just a little bit more than scouts will, and maybe they will be right. Mm -hmm. Once the coaches get involved in the process, and Sean McDermott and Marcus West get their eyes on a guy like Brennan Jackson. If the Bills don't get a defensive lineman early in this draft, like a defensive end early in this draft, like I don't have them getting one in this one, a guy like Brennan Jackson has a role for you right away, and he can develop into more. So that's why I went with Brennan Jackson with my pick here. Um, uh, I like that you did that because I feel like he's not getting enough love in this, uh, like in the entire process here. Um, so it's nice that, it's nice that you're showing him some love. So obviously he had the seven sacks in 2022, nine in 2023. I think size-wise he fits back-to-back -back mm -hmm. seasons with 12-plus tackles for loss as well. So he can get into the backfield, and you love the motor like you mentioned. All right. Rounding out round five here with our final pick of the fifth round, pick 163. I have the Buffalo Bills selecting... Evan Williams, safety out of the University of Oregon, and you have the Buffalo Bills selecting Jordan Jefferson, 
defensive mm. tackle out of the University of Louis- Louisiana State University, LSU. Sell us on Jordan Jefferson. This is so, a, two, this is a little, little double dip here. Little double dip. Okay. So I'm going for a little bit of a youth movement here on the interior of the defensive line. And obviously you your your marquee pick in the first round, Johnny Newton. He's gonna be your kind of rotational guy with Ed Oliver. Jordan Jefferson is a guy that you can come into the room and you can kind of year one use him as a backup one tech. You can use him to learn behind Ed Oliver and Johnny Newton. He could play three tech potentially. I think he's probably be a little bit better suited to play the one tech, but flexibility here as we get towards the later stages of round five is what I want for my interior defensive lineman at this stage. And he's not lacking in the weight. He's 313. The measurables are good for him. He doesn't have enough testing to get a RAS score this year. So, you know, you're going off the tape mostly from him. But at 6'4", 317, he's played a lot of A-gap snaps. He's played a lot of B-gap snaps. So that's both the one and three tech. Had a good week of practice at the Senior Bowl per John Helmkamp. Disruptive, strong hands. That's what I like to hear from my interior defensive lineman. And with the double dip here, now we start to piece together this interior defensive line room for the Bills. You've got Ed Oliver. You've got Johnny Newton. You've got Jordan Jefferson. You've got Daquan Jones. You've got Austin Johnson. So you're built for now. You're built for a little bit into the future as well. Mm -hmm. And that's a really strong five, in my opinion, to take with you into 2024. I'll be at two rookies. I still love the mix in that room. Yeah, I I love Jordan Jefferson as a player. I wish I would have double dipped at defensive tackle. Spoiler alert, I do not double dip at defensive tackle, (laughs) but he's the perfect kind of guy to utilize that double dip on. We've talked about how shallow that room is in terms of like 2025 and beyond. Mm -hmm. I went with Evan Williams here, undersized, sort of like not the greatest measurable safety in the world. 5'11", 200 pounds, 30-inch arms, 10-inch hands. It's a guy who's been starting for five years in college football, four years at Fresno State before his transfer to Oregon last year. This little snippet here from the draft network Williams is a versatile player and has experience at nickel and both safety spots. Williams is an undersized player who lacks top NFL strength, speed and length. Williams is a very instinctual football player who has a nose for the football. To me, that just screams like what the Buffalo bills are looking for in a safety, like alignment, versatility, nose for the football, willing to get his nose dirty playmaker might not have the best measurables. This is a guy who athletically looks very similar to a guy like Jordan Poyer who had success with the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills had a virtual meeting with Evan Williams, so that's not something to to be ignored as well. So I was a little mad. Dane Brugler put a lot of second and third round grades on some of my favorite safeties in this class, so they were untouchable by the fourth round because of the decision that I made. And there's a huge chunk of those guys. And maybe hopefully one of those guys in reality slips to the fourth round. And instead of Renardo green, maybe we can get one of those guys in the, in the fourth round. But in terms of the way the board fell, because this is the sort of parameters we gave this mock draft, I'm going to go with Evan Williams here because I think he can come in and who knows, maybe he can compete legitimately compete to be a starter. If not this year, next year. And he's got the attributes to be a pretty darn good special teams player as well. And maybe he's just a dependable backup. But hey, you could use a dependable backup on a four-year contract who's young. Absolutely. And we, I think we need to put like Dame Brugler's round projections next to these picks when we promo this out <laughs> or people are going to yell at us again. But I don't know. I think we're doing a pretty good job so far. So what is that? The I, I last so of our too. fifths? That's the last of our fifths. We are now on to the sixth round with the 200th selection. I have selected a twofer of South Dakota State offensive Ooh. linemen. I have taken Garrett Greenfield. Uh, another South Dakota Jack Rabbit, and you have taken an offensive lineman as well. You have taken guard center Dylan McMahon out of NC State. Talk about Dylan McMahon, the man who has the uh, the cheat code, the the short cheat shuttle, code. the short shuttle under that uh, number that I'm blanking off the top of my head, but the the shuttle number that has delivered the likes of Jason Kelsey and guys who have started like 80% of NFL games. It's that crazy statistic that they have the, the cheat code. But talk about Dylan McMahon a little bit. Yeah, and look, uh, both taking offensive linemen here. I will say in my like prelim- preliminary run through, I did have Garrett Greenfield on mine as well. Ended up having to make some tough decisions and take him off. So I'm super happy that you put him on there, and I knew you liked him. So I'm hoping that 
I'm, I, I was happy to see him on your mm-hmm. list. Dylan McMahon, obviously, played center for NC State in 2023, but before that, played a ton of snaps at left guard, a ton of snaps at right guard. If you look at his career snap split percentage, it's almost a third, a third, a third between left guard, right guard, center. I think center is actually uh, his second most, left guard is most, right guard is third most. I could be mixing one of those two of those up. Either way, this is a like this is a guy who profiles athletically similarly to Mitch Morse. Um, six four, a little over three hundred pounds. Athletically tested very well, um, over a nine point oh Raz and can come in and be a true interior swing type of player, which as you're looking for towards the end of the draft, that's the type of guy you're looking for. Mitch Morse is gone. Ryan Bates is gone. I know the Bills love Alec Anderson, but that leaves me a little bit concerned about what we have at the center position as far as a backup. So I like that McMahon can come in, can be your backup, can be a backup center, can be a backup to both left and right guards on this mm-hmm. roster. David Edwards is only here for another year. Who knows what that means? I think in another in another draft class, there are a lot of really good centers in this class that McMahon may have pushed up to like that fifth, fourth round range if there were fewer centers in this class. But because there are so many, he's down in that sort of sixth round range, which is fine because um, mm-hmm. he does have some limitations as well at the anchor point. But profile-wise, if the Bills are looking for something similar to what they've had in Mitch Morse in the past, McMahon kind of fits that bill. Yeah, I, I like McMahon. If he's the, the flyer the Buffalo Bills take at the end of the draft, I'm A-OK with that. And I'm also A-OK with my guy here, Garrett Greenfield, the guy, again, lower-level competition at South Dakota State, but he's got left-right versatility. He's got the size you look for, six foot five, 311, 33-inch arms. He had a huge week at the Shrine Bowl, which helped him get invited to the NFL Combine. So he proved he could hang in with higher level competition. And then when he got to the Combine, let me pull these numbers up here. My apologies for not having them directly in front of me, but he had a 38 and a half inch vertical. The Combine record for an offensive lineman. He had a nine foot five broad jump. He shows that he has this lower body explosion. So this guy is a freak athlete for his size he has left right versatility he's not like spencer brown because spencer brown like had very few snaps coming out of um his small school but this guy is a five-year starter he was one of those covid guys so five years of starting under his belt so i personally think in reality garrett greenfield is going to go higher in this draft but garrett greenfield is a guy who could be swing tackle day one and he's a guy who could honestly if the Buffalo Bills cannot retain the services of Spencer Brown, be your starting right tackle in 2025. I know I'm saying that about a six round pick, but I think in reality, he's not going to be a six round pick. So I couldn't pass up on a guy like Garrett Greenfield here. I mean, I love that. I, these super athletic offensive linemen, like it just, mm-hmm. it does it for me, man. And then both of these guys, McMahon and Greenfield fit the bill. They're both athletic freaks. <laughs> All right, on to the final pick of the sixth round, pick 204. I have selected University of Miami safety, who I will be transitioning to linebacker, James Williams, and you have taken running back Kamani Vidal out of the University of Troy. Kamani is a guy who's gotten a lot of love on this podcast, but talk about him just a little bit more here, Dave. Yeah, I mean, look, size-wise, he's not necessarily the the prototypical compliment, I would say to James cook, right? He's not necessarily a power back, but this is just a guy who gets it done. Uh, second most yards after contact of any running back in college football last year. Uh, he had the most 15 plus yard runs in college football last year. Pass protection is superb. Um, and from a locker room standpoint, I think this guy would just fit in phenomenally well. And so look, I know, People are maybe looking for the estimates for the Braylon Allens here, but we're now in the sixth round. I hadn't taken a running back yet. I think Vidal will be coveted as a UDFA if he does not get drafted. So with the Bills having all of their picks in this particular scenario we're playing out, mm-hmm. I went ahead and took him and, and guaranteed to get his services. So big fan of his and um, getting that running back to add to the room. Yeah, if again, if I had not looked at your mock draft previous, Kamani Vidal probably would have been 
uh, one of mine. He's one of my favorite guys to mock to the Bills in the later rounds. I feel like it's almost cheating getting a running back like him in the back half of the draft. But, you know, being a guy from Troy, I think that might devalue his stock a little bit. So great pick by you. I went with James Williams. He's a guy who has familiarity with Buffalo Bills current cornerbacks coach Jamila Adai, who was the secondary coach at the University of Miami in his final season there. However, Jamila Adai will not be coaching James Williams because I am transitioning him to linebacker. He is six foot four. He is 231 pounds. He's got almost 34 inch arms. He was a five star recruit out of high school, top 15 overall prospect nationally. Here is Lance Zierlein's write-up on Williams. He is a physical safety with a long athletic frame. While it's fun watching him run and strike from high safety, it is much less fun watching his coverage confusion. He doesn't see the game as clearly as teams might like right now, but he has the athleticism and cover skills to tighten up the windows on tight ends in man coverage. Williams might need a year to add weight and keep working on his game, but his traits and playing demeanor should earn him a role as a box safety or nickel linebacker. You bring him in. He is your fifth, sixth linebacker. He probably is an absolute dog on special teams. And then maybe someday you can find a niche role for him as either a box safety or an extra linebacker, or maybe even he develops into two, three years down the road, Matt Milano's replacement in competition with a guy like Dorian Williams. I think James Williams is just a freakish athlete who can contribute on special teams and can run and hit. You don't pass on guys like that in the sixth round. You you take chances on them. You take chances on them and you figure it out once you get them in the room, right? And mm-hmm. so, like, that's probably why he's going to go on day three because teams might be scared about what they they don't want to figure it out. They don't want to yeah. worry about what they're going to do with them. But the upside at that point in the draft, there is no there's no reason, especially if the Bills like in this scenario have all their picks to not take a swing on a guy like that. Mm-hmm. All right, so on to the final pick, pick number 248. We both take defensive backs. I take another corner. Oh, I took two corners. I'm already going to lose the fan vote, I think. A.J. Woods, cornerback out of the University of Pittsburgh. Of course, if it's the seventh round, the Buffalo Bills have to take a pit DB. And you take Trey Taylor, safety out of Air Force. Talk about Trey Taylor a little bit. He was the... Jim Thorpe award yes. winner, correct? For yes, the nation's top defensive, top back. defensive and, back. And yet he wasn't invited to the combine. He wasn't in any of these offseason things. So talk a little bit about Trey Tuck. Yeah, Shrine Bowl invite uh for him. Um, nation's top defensive back, the Jim Thorpe Award. He's actually Ed Reed's cousin, if you weren't uh familiar with that as well. Ravens hosting Trey Taylor on a top 30 visit, I might add. There's a really good interview. Um with Justin Mello from the Draft Network that he did in early March uh, with Trey Taylor about his mindset, his leadership, where he came from, how he learned from the reps he's had at Air Force and how his mindset is that he was continuously going to get better and that he's a winner. Good ball skills, three picks in 2023 to go along with seven pass breakups. And when Justin Mello asked him about it, he said, well, there were also two other ones that I dropped that I should have had. So this guy is a competitor. He's one of the highest character guys in this draft. Uh, look, I went with MJ Devonshire earlier at corner. I didn't take a safety early in the draft. My guy, Javon Bullard, passed on him. Didn't take Tyke Smith late. I didn't take a safety until right now. Trey Taylor at the tail end of this draft, where um, I believe Dane Brugler ranks him as either mm-hmm. a seventh, I think seventh slash PFA, priority free agent, I believe, or it might just be a seventh, but... To me, this is like the perfect way for me to round out my draft, getting that safety um, in Trey Taylor, who is going to work his ass off to make this team and to to be a contributor. And to me, a guy that you want in the locker room. And Mm -hmm. he's just quickly become like one of my favorite players just overall in this entire draft class. And so couldn't pass him up, took him here. Perfect time for me to take him with the last pick. This last pick here uh, of mine, AJ Woods, he doesn't have the size that you probably want five foot nine, 186 with 29 inch arms, but he had a hell of a week at the East West Shrine. And the Buffalo Bills have been connected to him, right? He's yes. got 
the pit yep. connections. He was invited to the Buffalo Bills local pro day. The Buffalo Bills spoke to him at the Shrine Bowl. There were a number of people who were at the Shrine Bowl who talked about his abilities on special teams. He was used as a gunner, and he made some standout plays as a gunner on special teams. This guy just reeks seventh-round pick party free agent that Sean McDermott will want on his football mm-hmm. team. Even if it's just a practice squad guy, not all draft picks are going to make it. And this is a guy you could probably draft in the seventh round, and it's just a shortcut because he would have been one of your first calls as a priority free agent. He's probably a guy you can sneak onto the practice squad if you really want. And the thing about Woods is you get the versatility. I've mentioned the special teams already. He can probably be uh, a four-phase special teams contributor. On top of that, at Pitt, he's played man, he's played zone, he's played inside, he's played outside, and he's held his own uh, and done fairly well, 29 career pass breakups in all of those areas. So he just gives you versatility. He... um, he from all aspects and for everything I've heard, like he's a grinder, he's a hard worker, all those various different things. He just doesn't have the size that you want. So here you take just this versatile, hardworking lunch pail type of DB who just gets the job done despite his lack of size. You just pretty much a shortcut to probably would have been one of your first calls as a PFA here in the seventh round. Yeah. And what you just said is like it, perfectly encapsulates the pit dbs that we've drafted yeah. on this team. like <laughs> that sums up dane jackson that sums up damar hamlin so i mean why not go to the well again right if it's working for you all right so let's put these two mocks up side by side we have dave's mock which one through ten went johnny newton xavier leggett javon baker caden wallace mo kamara MJ Devonshire, Jordan Jefferson, Dylan McMahon, Kamani Vidal, and Trey Taylor. Dave, looking at this draft, you know, the draft is over. You're doing some self reflection. Mm-hmm. What's your biggest regret? Yeah, look, I mean, part of me regrets not maybe taking a safety a little bit earlier in the draft, but the more I think about it and seeing Trey Taylor on the team, like I like for me, that's a that's a heartfelt pick for me right now. Um, look, I think that you could make the case that my biggest regret would, was that I didn't take a wide receiver in the first round, right? Mm -hmm. You could, you could say, well, the combination of Xavier Leggett and Javon Baker are redundant with each other. Their skill sets are, uh, and where they would play on the field are too similar. But to me, as we talked about in our Sunday show, we've got Samuel, we've got Shakir, we've got Kincaid roaming the middle. I wanted to bring in two guys that I knew could contribute on the boundary. So maybe there's a little regret there about some redundancy in Mm -hmm. in the types of wide receivers I I selected and maybe not taking a wide receiver with the first pick. But overall, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. My draft from start to finish, Adnay Mitchell, Michael Hall Jr., Mason McCormick, Renardo Green, Anthony Gould, Brennan Jackson, Evan Williams, Garrett Greenfield, James Williams, and A.J. Woods. You might notice, Dave, there's a position group that I often mock, you often mock, the people often mock to the Buffalo Bills that I did not select, and that was running back. In this exercise, Dane Brugler had a lot of running backs with third-round grades. So when he got to the fourth round, I talk about Tyrone Tracy a lot, and he was available. I talk about Ray Davis a lot. He was available. I wanted to go in a little bit of a different direction with the picks I made there with Mason McCormick and Renardo Green because, to me, running back, what the Bills can do now is graded by Dane Brugler as Frank Gore Jr., a PFA. You can go out and you can sign Frank Gore Jr. as an undrafted free agent. Kendall Milton, I believe, was also a a PFA on Dane Brugler's board. Go out and get one of those guys, right? So now you've added that to the room. And then on top of that, there are still two running backs sitting out there on the free agent market and Trey White's money is going to come off the books in June. Ezekiel Elliott and Kareem Hunt could both be viable options for the Buffalo Bills, experience options for the Buffalo Bills in their backfield behind James Cook. We need to let James Cook this year. I won't mind if we take a running back, but I also will not lose my mind if we don't because I do believe we'll, we, we will be adding to this room. I think you can get good PFAs. I think you can get some guys in free agency. So that is my biggest regret because there's a lot of running backs I like, but I just went in a different direction in this draft. And sometimes the board just doesn't fall the way you want it to. Like Brandon Bean said, the board didn't fall the way he wanted to last year with defensive tackle. Yeah. And I think I I love the idea of adding 
Zeke Elliott after June 1st, right? Uh, I mean, to me, that is like a perfect fit mm -hmm. for what you need to complement James Cook and showed that he still had some juice left in New England last year on a really bad New England team. So yeah. I would be all for that type of move. Let's hope, let's hope a running back needy team like Dallas doesn't come in and, and snake him. I don't yeah. know if he has any familiarity with that franchise, but all right. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us in the comment section. Tell us who you think won and why who had the better mock draft myself or Dave. I will not be offended. If you choose Dave, I might actually vote for Jay Dave. If we put these two drafts up side by side. So uh, thank you much so much for joining us. And again, we have you covered starting next week. We're going to do our no matter what show on Monday. Mm -hmm. And then we have round one of the NFL draft. We will be facilitating the coverage starting at 8 p.m. Eastern. We will take you all the way to the Bills pick. We'll give you a little bit of our thoughts on the Bills pick. And then Greg Tomset and Anthony Prohaska will join in or they will start a fresh live stream reacting specifically to the Bills pick. Rounds two and three will be covered by Anthony. We will be panelists as well as many other people here at Cover One. And the Cover One Roundup guys will be covering day three of the draft. All of the various different Cover One personalities will be in and out of all of these live streams. And we will have boots on the ground in Detroit. Tom DeLoss, he will be there. John Helmkamp, he will be there. Is there a third Joe person? DeRose. Joe, Joe DeRose is going to be there as well. So we'll have boots on the ground there as well. So we have you covered this year for the 2024 NFL draft. Dave, any final thoughts before we get out of here? We're getting close, right? And we got a couple shows or no matter what show, one of our favorite shows, maybe our favorite mm -hmm. show of the entire year. I really liked this um, approach to the mock draft, right? Not using the simulator, just going yeah. off of Dane Brugler's it was refreshing. It was a very refreshing approach to doing it. And it, it was actually hard, like, cause mm -hmm. the, the simulators get a little predictive. And yeah. you can kind of game them a bit. This was tough because you really yeah. had to just stick to this is the round projection. This how is many, guys. how many screenshots did I send you of my, uh, of my, I think I sent you three before I, I landed on my final. I, I had my like notes app up and I was like, okay, this is it. Nope. And then I like, was like, okay, where was this guy? Yeah. And I was like changing <laughs> it. And then I finally was like, all right, I just got to pick something. And, and I went with it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. And as always go bills, go bills. Thank you for watching tonight's episode of the Air Raid Hour. Make sure to hit that like button on the way out. If you are catching the show on demand, leave a reply in the comment section and we will respond over the course of the week. You can always listen to every episode next day on all major podcasting platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify by searching Air Raid Buffalo. Thank you for your continued support and as always, Go Bills!